My guest today is Andy Huang. Andy, how are you? Good, David. How about you? I'm doing fantastic. It's a beautiful Friday in Chicago, and the sun is shining, and life's good. Can't complain about a Friday. <laughs> what do you do, Andy? Uh, I am a cloud solution architect, uh, focusing on built, yeah, building cool stuff with partners specifically. Yeah, I was uh, like, I think you look a little familiar. I feel like I've seen yeah. you before. For folks listening at home, Andy and I are on the same team. We have similar jobs, yeah. and we've been working together for one year and one day. <laughs> and uh, uh, I asked him to be on my show because he's a smart guy. And then I said, uh, you pick the topic. And you you selected resiliency. I, resiliency. I know, it's a little, I know it's a broad topic, <laughs> but uh, we can definitely uh, get a little deeper in some areas for sure. Let's let's start with the definition. What do you mean when you say re resiliency? So resiliency is when your application continues to to function despite maybe high load or maybe a piece of your application or infrastructure failing. So maintaining that uptime so that whether it be Microsoft.com or some other website that you're hosting is still up. Okay, so we uh, the, it built into that definition is the, we acknowledge something can go wrong. You know, you're, uh, there could be a failure somewhere. There could be a, a software hardware failure. There could be just a gazillion users all at once. Um, yep. And and a lot of that has to do with um, uptime. Uptime as measured in nines. Can you can you tell us about what that means? Yeah, you usually hear about it in like, you know, like you mentioned, nines, like three nines, 99.9% .9 uptime, or you might hear four nines or five nines. So it just keeps adding to that. And while it's easy to think about it in nines, I also like to add in how many minutes of downtime does that mean? So three, three nines, 99.9 .9 is eight hours of downtime, roughly, uh, in, a, in a give it per year, right? Uh, if you go to four nines, you're down to 52 minutes per year. So that's a huge change in just adding one more nine. Um, if you go five nines, you're talking about around five minutes per year, which is not a lot of time if we think about it. Yeah. Uh, why doesn't everyone just go to five nines? It's, uh, uh, it seems like the less downtime you have, the more uptime, the better. Absolutely. Uh, the short answer is, it's complex and expensive. Uh, we're always changing our applications. We're probably always deploying new features. Making changes means that there's put more potential for, for downtime. Not to mention, you also have to architect your infrastructure to support that. So an example of this that I like to give is if you didn't have a 5.9 SLA, you or actually maybe even even lower, if you didn't have a, such a high SLA, you could probably get away with deploying everything into one region and one availability zone. You may not think about load balancing if it's just some basic application that doesn't require high uptime. Okay. But, but suddenly, if you need to increase that availability, you might be increasing the number of zones that you're deploying to, increasing the number of regions that you're deploying to, which means uh, more hardware, more maybe whether you're running on VMs or AKS or even serverless, you're running more instances of that. Okay, uh, so I think the point you're making is that there's a, uh, there's a cost. Absolutely. Increasing that liability tenfold, and maybe the benefits don't really justify that cost. You know, do I really do I really need this thing to be up all but five minutes a year? Yeah, maybe if it's monitoring somebody's heart rate or keeping satellites in the sky, maybe yeah. I do. But if it's just you know an application that tracks the the music that I'm listening to, and it's down for an hour a year, two you know ten hours a year. Uh, oh, another another great example is uh, maybe you're in uh, the education education field, and it's like, okay, well, when school isn't in session, we have time to do major downtimes. That could be something to consider. So it definitely varies industry by industry. Now let's talk about some ways that we can increase resiliency. You brought up this redundancy, multi-region redundancy. Well, well, let's start with that, actually. Tell me a little about how does that increase your the resiliency of the application. Yeah, so it allows for a distributed 
architecture at a high level. So you can have one region with your application that is running and then another region with that same application also available. Now above that, you can have something like um, Azure Front Door that can distribute globally into other regions. And that means that in the event one region goes down, you can direct your customers to another region that is still working. So in some insane scenario where Godzilla comes through and, and, and hits one region, all those data centers are down, your customers can still route to another region. Maybe instead of U, uh, East US, they can be routed to West US. That's good news for West US. <laughs> Bad <laughs> news for Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other ways that we can increase reliability of our application? Uh, some other ways that we can increase reliability is uh, like fault tolerances. So how your application responds to failures. That's that's one way to to think about it. Is able to retry some type of calls from that from that method. Uh, another thing I like to think about are like message queues. Being able to pull from a message queue whenever you're processing a request, and maybe those can be processed in in multiple areas. One more thing I like to think about, and this kind of goes back to that distributed architecture, is you know making sure that you can load balance across multiple services uh, in multiple regions, but also making sure that you scale. So we, I, I shared about Godzilla, which is you know knock on wood, not something that's not going to happen, but let's think about something more realistic. Let's think about Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday, you see that huge amount of traffic go up. Uh, Black Friday for retail stores is probably sure. another one where you just have this sudden spike. Or maybe if it's just uh, something that you might have, you know, you might hear like the, the Reddit hug of death, something got very popular on Reddit or social media, and then thousands or millions of people suddenly come to your site and your application can't, your site can't handle yeah. the load. Oprah, because... Oprah Winfrey mentions it on her show and Ex all exactly. of her minions suddenly yeah. swarm to your site. <laughs> exactly. And it, and that was unanticipated. So that is another thing to to think about. It doesn't have to be a disaster, you know, a data center going down. It can be suddenly a lot of people very interested in your content. How do we handle that? How do we prepare, prepare for that? We can prepare for that um, with scale. So a, a number of Azure services from Azure VM scale sets to some of our serverless like uh, Azure functions, those can scale horizontally. So uh, what scaling horizontally means that instead of having uh, one instance get larger individually, so instead of having more CPU, more RAM, more disk added to it, that's scaling vertically, you scale horizontally. So instead of having one instance of your application, you have maybe 10 or maybe 100, and you can scale so that you can handle more requests coming in. So that's a, an example of how you might be able to handle that type of load. Um, if we set up all these things before we go into production, uh, is there a way that we can have some comfort level to know that that it, it will scale, that it will be reliable, that it will be able to uh, handle failures in a region, for example, before we deploy to production? Absolutely. So this is where some other tools such as Azure load testing or load testing in general and chaos engineering uh, can come into play and can help in those scenarios. So we do have Azure Load Testing and Azure Chaos Studio to handle those types of situations. Now, when I think about these tools, I usually like to say, you know, this isn't something that you just turn on and just go, send that meter to the max and just send all the load and break everything and, and see how it goes. I like to make sure that people are more methodical with it. Uh, I like to think of it as don't just turn on load testing to the max, kind of have almost like a scientific method approach. You think of uh, hypotheses of what you're going to experience. Using the Oprah and your website example, you know, you can say, OK, I normally get uh, 10,000 users per day. So we can start with that load just to make sure that we're getting that expected outcome. And then you can increase that. You can say, well, what if we double the amount of users suddenly in a short period of time? We can say, okay, let's let's test out 20,000 users. You can then run the experiment and see how your application is able to handle it. Is it still handling it where performance is still the same? 
or is it handling it, but you're noticing that performance is starting to creep up where you may need to think about your, your potential design in the future. And then you can go on, go ahead and go from there. Now, that is the load testing side. You take those same principles and you apply it to the chaos engineering side. You might say, okay, I have a number of pods running in Kubernetes, and I think that my application should still be running if one pod were to fail. Okay. And you can test out that failure, make sure that you know that pod fails, and then see, okay, my application is still running, or ooh, I thought my application was still run, but apparently if one pod fails, uh, it has some other issues that come up and it is not working as expected. Hmm, interesting. And Chaos Studio helps to test these things? Correct. Chaos Studio has, uh, you can build a number of experiments within it, and then within experiments you can create faults, and there are a number of different faults, which are the errors that you're inducing. So you can uh, leverage Chaos Mesh, which can do the pod faults that I mentioned before. You can simulate high CPU pressure or maybe even stop or kill a service. So that's great. Maybe you want to just kill a process on a, on a VM and see how does your application react when something like that happens. There are also some unique ones that I really like playing with. So for example, you can even deny access to Key Vault. How does your application react when all of a sudden it can't access the secrets that it was expecting? So these are some some interesting faults that you can test with. Oh, that's interesting. And I've been hearing more and more about this chaos stuff, not just from Azure, but I, I think it was Netflix that uh, first popularized it with their chaos monkey, where they had things deliberately breaking things randomly in production just to validate that. That, that that everything worked. I'm not sure that I had the courage to do that for my applications, but they are. They're they're doing it. it works. They are, and that's where I that's where I heard it too. Chaos. Uh, I think I wanted to think chaos the, monkey. Chaos, I think like chaos said. monkey. They call it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's where I heard about it first. I remember when I first heard about it, I was like, they're they're just trying to bring it down, and that's yeah. impressive. That's the and that brings up a great point. When I talk a lot about DevOps methodologies, you always hear about shift left, shift left, try and bring things, find things faster, find things earlier. Right. I, I love talking about resiliency because while yes, you do do it in the earlier phases, like in development and QA phases, you can also shift right. You don't hear about shift right very often, you know, because once you become mature enough, you can test in production, leveraging chaos engineering and, and load testing, for example. And it may make sense. It's definitely a very mature process once you've gone to that level, so it's not something I recommend day one. But uh, what to call um, if you do shift right and test in production, sometimes you have to because there's just different environments or different behaviors that you're not able to always emulate in the lower environments. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a bold strategy. It I, is. <laughs> you mentioned the. Uh, what would happen if, for example, the key vault access was denied? Um, there's, if that happens, it's likely your application won't be perfect because it, it may have some stale data. You could cache that information, for example, and mm -hmm. still use it. But if somebody updates one of those keys, you're not, you, you, you won't have that. And I think that's an example of graceful degradation, which means that there's uh, yeah, the application isn't perfect, but given that this failure, it still functions. People can still buy your widgets online. They can still access their content. It's right. or they, you know maybe they're watching videos, but it's slower now. I think things like that. That is, it's not a total failure. What what do you think about that? Yeah, no, that's that's a fantastic concept because right now consumers, when when the site is even slow like unbearably slow. It might not be down, but it, it it feels like it's pretty much is. And users are likely not using every feature in an application too. So if, like you mentioned, the uh, graceful degradation, if you can still maintain a high degree of integrity, maybe there are little, you know, small features that might be broken during that time, but you can still maintain and have most of them still working. That is still a fantastic outcome versus being completely down. Yeah, I and I was a consultant for many years, and I did a lot of work for a big uh, electronic retailer. And one of their key things was, no matter what happens, 
we have to be able to take the customer's money. And they had they had in-store systems running on kind of older PCs. The hardware was, was slow. The internet connection often wasn't great. You know, these stores are all over the country. Uh, no matter what happens, if they lost totally lost connection to the servers in their data center, they still have to take be able to take the person's money. That was the minimum level of functionality you need to have, and they could degrade everything else up to that point. Yeah, uh, and, and and that makes sense. I mean, a wish list is probably not the most important feature if you had to rank them right, and right. on an online on an online retailer. But uh, checking out is probably extremely important. <laughs> Adding to cart again, extremely important. Right. Oh, very cool. Um, this is a lot of really good information. But have we covered? Is there anything we have not covered that's important? I mean, I, I know we could speak for days on details. Yeah. Uh, I think the last thing I'd probably want to add since we talked about how we can test these things or test if your application is resilient is that we also need to include monitoring into the loop. Oh, because yeah. if you test your application or you try to inject those uh, errors through chaos engineering, how do you truly know your application is experiencing those issues? How do you truly know that your application is not responding properly and monitoring, which again is probably an, another topic for another day since we can go deep there as well, will allow you to kind of get that insight. You can see how it's performing now, how it's performing compared to it was maybe a week ago, a month ago, uh, the previous release. And so those are those are insights that are beneficial while you're making these uh, analyses. That's a great point. Another lesson I learned from my consulting days is customers will lie <laughs> about almost anything. They'll say this yeah. thing is way slower than it was last week. <laughs> yes. And yeah. it just what they mean is it feels slower, but if you had actual numbers to back it up, then you can actually address that and say, let's yeah. get it back to where it was last week. That was acceptable. Nobody complained then. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and what feels slow to one customer or one yeah. end user is different from another one. So it, it's hard to gauge those yeah. words into numbers. Feel slow is not a good measure, you know, right? Uh, pages per second, or how, how load time of a page, web page, right. that's a good number. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, Andy, thank you so much for your time. This has been really educational. Well, thanks for having me, David. It was great. It's an interesting story how I got into the technology industry. So when I was in high school, I loved playing video games, computer games, building my own PCs. And when time came to go to college, I wasn't sure what I was going to major in. So I had two majors. I had finance because I thought, well, I'm decent at math or computer science. And luckily, I had friends that were already in computer science classes, and they said, hey, Andy, why don't you just join us? And that's the uh, that's how I got into computer science. Oddly enough, they dropped out after <laughs> out of the major after <laughs> a few weeks or actually, no, a few semesters. I shouldn't say a few weeks, a few semesters for their own individual reasons. And I I was like, I'm already so deep into it. I'm just going to finish it. And I still enjoyed it, and I'm really happy how it all ended out. <laughs>